Let us this pray for you who graciously behold every effort you unworthy servants make towards repentance. Look favorably on the earnest desire for repentance that fills us this evening. In the words of the prophet David, we beseech you to ensure a pure heart in us, in our belly a new and constant spirit, so that we too may walk before you in purity and holiness, like our lady the Theotokos. For you are a good God and God of mercy and compassion and love for us. And we give you glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. Thank you and welcome back to the eight dates. It is nice to be together again and to share in our faith this evening's topic is one that resonates with everyone, married or single. The focus on work and money is something that deeply impacts all of us. How are we going to pay our bills? How do we choose what to spend on for our money? How many more hours can we work so that we can afford even more things, even if those things are not really necessary in our lives, but only bring material fulfillment. These are difficult questions we must ask ourselves individually and as couples. In many families, both the husband and wife work. Are you both working so that you have enough money to pay for child care? If one of you stay at home, would the quality time with your family be offset by the savings in daycare? Do you find yourselves looking at your co-workers, your neighbors and your friends, perhaps with a bit of envy when you see their new home, their nice cars, designer clothes and seemingly perfect life? Be careful not to compare yourselves with others and especially with the outward aspects of life. Everything looks picture perfect when you are looking from the outside. But remember that even if you dress up a poor man in the most expensive clothing, he will still be poor. And those materialistic items are not what will gain you eternal life. It is how you take care of your soul that truly really matters. The timing of this week's topic actually could not be more appropriate with the upcoming Nativity Fast, which begins on November 15th. Though Christmas is about seven weeks away, let us reflect for a moment on the night of Christ's birth. There was a bright star in the sky and the three Magi followed the star and came to worship the baby Jesus. What did they bring? The finest, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought gifts befitting of a king. But we also remember the words from a timeless Christmas song, The Little Drummer Boy. He was a poor boy and wanted to see this special child who was born. But what did he have to offer? Materially nothing. But what did he offer? His music came from the heart. My dear friends, it is not the cost of a gift that matters. It is the motivation behind it. Money problems are real and they are the cause of great marital discord. But like that little child, who came with his drum on Christmas morning, let us focus on what really matters, simplicity and genuineness. Do not let money become divisive in your homes and in your marriages. Discuss what is important. Listen. Listen attentively. Compromise if you have to. It has often been recommended that each time you get paid, that you pay yourself first by designating even just a small amount 
for your savings account. This is a good practice and one that can even be taught to teenagers when they get their first job. But do not just pay yourself first. Pray yourself first. Pray over each and every decision in your marriage. Turn your cares over to the Lord and he will illuminate your path and guide you in your next steps forward to a marital fulfillment. Thank you for having me here and I'm looking forward to a very lovely discussion. God bless you. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Um, I want to actually give an introduction to our presenter uh, in a moment, my good friend, Joe Borgonia. But I want to start with, I heard Father Mel Weber speak at our church years ago. And he said that um, to be a devout Orthodox Christian is actually not that hard. Oh, except when it comes to sex and money. And that struck me. And, you know, these are two topics we're covering, you know, sex we did already, now we're on money. So there's something about this topic tonight that can pull us away from being centered. And I find both topics super important, super part of our lives, and yet can tap into deeper parts of us and sometimes unhealed parts of us. And so as we move into this topic, we really are asking the Lord to help us bring orthodoxy to all parts of our life. And for tonight, it is would be... Um, uh, money and and our work um, and how we show up to all that. So in introduction to my friend Joe Borgonia, I wanted just to honestly just say that uh, he's a dear friend. Uh, he's a licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, and he grew up in San Francisco. And uh, we grew up actually a few neighborhoods apart, didn't know each other. He went to Cal Berkeley. Uh, he ended up being very successful in the early days of Silicon Valley. And yet... And then Joe gave me permission just to share a little bit of his story uh, as it relates to, um, I met him and I'm a therapist, but I was doing work for a big sort of mega church, evangelical church where I ran a counseling center and a recovery um, uh, ministry. And Joe found himself there needing what we were offering because in all the success that he experienced, and he's such a, a, a sweet soul, what he experienced was a broken marriage and coming through a divorce was devastating. So he found himself in our divorce recovery ministry. Now, by the way, to this day, he is our guy on our family wellness team that helps train for divorce recovery. Uh, but back then he was in a place of brokenness. Uh, he had grown up Catholic, had become Presbyterian, had been married and part of a big church in Berkeley. And yet things broke apart and I found him to be an amazing brother, an amazing man, but in a state of brokenness. Fast forward, and this is my testimonial to Joe, is he faced his brokenness, both in terms of his divorce and the things that caused the divorce. And in that ministry environment that we were in, and I was director of that, uh, and he was a participant, he came up the ranks because he allowed the healing to happen so much that he ended up becoming one of my volunteers that led the divorce recovery and led anger management and led all kinds of things that were life-giving to help other people in places of brokenness. So Joe took it further in terms of this is his heart. You get you, know, you give that guy a little bit of healing and he went on to get his master's in marriage family therapy and he's a licensed marriage family therapist. He finds out a little bit about orthodoxy. Maybe I told him a little bit about orthodoxy and he became an orthodox Christian. So here's our brother, Joe, who I think is the consummate disciple, consummate learner, consummate student, consummate um, a heart-to-heart -heart kind of guy. We say in family wellness, face-to-face, heart-to-heart. And Joe, my brother, um, I know you in no other way but face-to-face, heart-to-heart. So thank you for being part of our team. 
and uh, we love you. And please share a little bit of uh, what you're going to roll out for us on this topic of money. Great. Thank you very much, George. Wow. Welcome, everyone. It's good to be here. And um, while watching our video this evening, please try to keep in mind our three C's, curiosity, commitment, and connection. We want to try and be aware of all these three things, especially when we talk about money. Um, our Metropolitan sort of added a, an additional C, which would be compromise. That could be added as a possible fourth as well. So um, please keep these four things in mind. Sit back and enjoy the video. Welcome everyone. I'm excited to be here and to share some thoughts and ideas about money from John Gottman's book, Eight Dates. Also, to prepare ourselves to go on date number four, where we'll be talking about the cost of love, work, and money. Before we get into our topic though, I want to put out a question to everyone. Besides being rich and famous and having a lot of money, what do all of these music artists have in common? Answer, all of them have either written or sang songs about love, money, or work. Some had all three themes in the same song. Other songs had no lyrics, they were instrumentals, but the song had either the words love, money, or work in the title. So, what is it about money that it's so easy to write songs about, perform before packed coliseums, but difficult for couples to talk about one-on-one. -on -one. At times, money somehow seems to become an intrinsic extension of ourselves, and we get a gut reaction when the topic comes up. Last week, we discussed sexual intimacy. Money falls into the same category as one of the five top issues in a marriage that causes conflict. Gottman even goes further to say from research that financial arguments were the best predictor of divorce. That's a sobering thought. But money does not have to be seen as a source of avoidance, contention, and conflict, but as a vehicle to communicate and connect. And that's what we want to do on our date, as with all of our dates. The most important goal of this date is to uncover and understand what money means, first of all to ourselves and secondly to our spouse. Is it security, success, freedom, happiness? Keep in mind that each of us has a complex history that defines our beliefs about money and how we use it. We want to start the conversation of understanding how to talk about money together as a couple. Not just to have an understanding of money here, but more importantly, to understand our spouse and gain a deeper connection with them in the process. At a company I used to work at, four of us were responsible for the operations of the business. The owner told us, I don't care about the courses of action that you guys decide in my absence. I'm more concerned about how decisions were made. If we pay attention to how we talk about money, it's a greater chance that decisions we make as a couple are going to be more sound, having more discernment, and one that is workable to both people. When we are able to listen actively and skillfully and connect on that level, money can then become a true asset in our marriage. Maintain that curiosity about your spouse. So is money and work the cost of love? Keep that question on the back burners and we'll come back to it later on. So how much is enough money? That's going to be different for everyone. We all have different levels of comfort as well as thresholds when something becomes a concern. The more relevant question might be, what are my priorities based on what I do have? St. John Chrysostom isn't famous for any songs that he might have written, but he is for the sermons that he preached specifically about wealth and poverty. 
In one of his sermons, he writes, Let us learn not to call the rich lucky, nor the poor unfortunate. Rather, if we are to tell the truth, the rich man is not the one who has collected many possessions, but the one who needs few possessions. And the poor man is not the one who has no possessions, but the one who has many desires. We ought to consider this the definition of poverty and wealth. So if you see someone greedy for many things, you should consider him the poorest of all, even if he has acquired everyone's money. If, on the other hand, you see someone with few needs, you should count him the riches of all, even if he has acquired nothing. Let's keep in mind St. John Chrysostom's words as a grounding stake in how we view money as we go forward here. In discovering what money means to each of us, Gottman talks about the spender and the saver. I want to refer to them as money styles, not as money personalities. Money is an external object. It's outside of ourselves. We may develop certain attachments to it, either by circumstances or choice, and acquire accompanying behaviors regarding money. But our identity is not defined by our behaviors or our riches, but by how God made us, which is in his image and likeness. There is no wrong or right in being any of these money styles. Each style has its advantages as well as its drawbacks, if taken to extremes. Keep in mind also that none of us are exclusively one particular money style or another. We don't want to stereotype our partners as being only this or only that. That would be black and white thinking. All of us can be blends of each style, depending on the situation and what's at stake at the time. Let's look at each of the money styles. First of all, the spender. This person might see himself as using money to live a happy life, having comfort, health, and fun. To others, the spender might be seen as frivolous, impulsive, extravagant, and self-indulgent. The saver, on the other hand, might see himself as conservative, wise, values money as an accomplishment, success, freedom from worry, or an investment in the future. By the same token, others might see the saver as miserly, stingy, cheap, selfish, a person who doesn't know how to enjoy pleasure. In addition to the spender and the saver, Elena Banks, who is a financial coach, identifies two other money styles. The first one is the investor. The investor's goal is to establish residual income. Their plan is to go out and make money that will go out and make more money. Everything they spend is seen as an investment and they expect a return. The other money style is what she terms as the bohemian. Now for them, money is the last thing on their minds. They may be free-spirited and they defy social conventions of what success might look like. Why do I need money when I have talent? If things don't work out, they see it as just part of the journey. How many folks in the entertainment world that have made a lot of money and all of a sudden we hear about them filing bankruptcy? With money comes a responsibility. Money is an object of value. Jesus himself, above all, spoke in parables about riches and how we should regard money. The story of Lazarus and the rich man. The parable of the servant who buried his master's money and didn't do anything until the master returned and required an accounting of it. The rich fool who built storehouses to keep all his grain and more, but in vain, as his soul was demanded of him that night. No matter what our money style is or blends of each style, there's a charge to be a faithful steward of the resources that we do have, knowing that all of it comes from God and giving back to him a portion of what was given to us. On date number four, you and your spouse will have a chance to explore what money means to each of you, 
not just on the surface level, but underneath. We want to go beneath the tip of the iceberg. What drives us in regards to money? Where do our attitudes about money come from? Why do I basically identify with a particular money style and not another? Godman directs us to look into our family histories. How did my parents handle money? Did they spend it, save it, invest it? How did they talk about money with each other? What messages did they communicate to me about money? What are my own dreams and goals pertaining to money? While talking about your family histories, notice what emotions come up for you also. Our family history and emotional history can affect how we do money in our relationships. Last session, George introduced the feelings chart, the emotions with the faces attached to it. There is an emotional component that is attached to money. Use that chart as a guide to connect with your feelings about money, back then with your parents and now as an adult. It's not uncommon today and even the norm that both husband and wife work and have careers. Often one of the spouses may work more hours than the other. How would that play out in the household and in home life? If one spouse doesn't work at all, but stays home with the kids, would that spouse end up doing most of the household chores? Gottman reports that if the stay-at-home spouse did all the chores at home, grocery shopping, errands, preparing meals, taking care of the kids, cleaning, the unpaid work, so to speak, would cost approximately $90,000 a year if they hired someone else to do it. That's a lot of money and a lot of work. In 2007, Pew Research did a study and found that after faithfulness and a good sex life, sharing household chores was the most important element of a successful marriage. Couples fight more about the division of labor in the household than they do about their paying jobs outside of the home. Keep in mind also that our jobs and marriages fall into a larger context of life. Many of us also have additional priorities that compete with our time as a couple. Social commitments, friends and relatives, community involvement, children, our personal health and fitness, recreational, personal growth, hobbies, church, and our spiritual life as well. Gottman shares the story of a young couple, the wife doing her medical residency and her the husband supporting her in her work. They had limited or no time as a couple. She being on call 24 seven, eventually propelled their marriage into a crisis and serious decisions had to be made. Both in tears, they decided that their marriage was the most important thing in their life and came up with a priority. First on their list was their health and spiritual well-being. Second was their marriage, then family. Third was work and money. How do we balance work, love, our home life with all the responsibilities with chores? What priorities outside of our marriage do we need to agree upon? What boundaries do we need to set in place to ensure that we can have and maintain connection with our spouse? The priorities will be different and unique for all of us. It's important to talk about the individual priorities that we value, as well as our priorities as a couple. I want to revisit the question earlier that was posed in the beginning. Is work and money the cost of love? In 1 Corinthians 13, St. Paul wrote one of the most striking and beautiful descriptions. His words describe love. Patience, kindness, not being envious or boastful, truthfulness, love protects, honors, trusts, hopes, perseveres. These attributes would be themes for great songs that could be written. These words, when put into action, is what we give of ourselves to have and maintain love in our marriages. 
These are the currencies of connection, if you will. Money and work are important, and they certainly have their place. But these virtues are the true cost of love. This is what we pay, or rather, what we can give freely of ourselves. Invest in these virtues and make them part of your song and how you do life and in staying connected with your spouse. Knows how to speak to my soul Till the stars fall out of the sky And the rivers, they all run dry Baby, you're my only one Till the silver that runs through our head Don't you know that I'll always be there? Baby, I swear on this earth I die You're the only one It can be really alarming when you have different styles, but it's actually really normal that two people will have different styles. It's easy to think that, oh my gosh, that's a problem, but actually not. It is a problem if we think my style is the right one and my spouse's style is a problem. But actually what Joe nicely talked about is these different styles really become the way we start a conversation and discover about ourselves and our spouse and become a beautiful first step in connecting and then making a plan together. It's just part of this beautiful discovery if we can resist right and wrong and get that curiosity and connection. These questions are just to start that conversation, that invitation. Number one, in what ways have money issues been stressful in your relationship? And number two, how has the money style you grew up in impacted the way you approach finances as an adult. Awesome. Neat. Breakout room questions. First one from the video, pick one thing that spoke to you the most about money and relationships and why. Second question, with all the different money styles, what are the pros and cons of your particular style? And the last one, most of us have heard the popular term work, life, balance. What are signals to you that your work, life, balance me may be out of balance? But I'm happy to share a couple thoughts. And I, I, I think the topic is profound, as Press Pat said, and Joe did such a terrific job. And I'm sure in your breakout, you guys discussed a lot of, from your own perspective what's going on for you. I just want to conclude just a couple minutes, a couple thoughts. Um, one is Jesus says you can't serve two masters, either God or money. I think you use the word mammon, but God or money. So I just want to bring up the one thought that uh, that this idea that we find our security in Christ is a big deal. It's it, well more than a big deal. It's life itself. We find our security in Christ. We find life from the one who gives life. Money is one of those things that if I think about the Old Testament and the, you, you know, really wild stories in the, in the Old Testament, it, you go, you know, from like Moses and they're oppressed in Egypt and they're going to head to the promised land because God's going to deliver them. And, and then they end up in the wilderness. And for us Californians uh, to go from uh, where they were in the wilderness to the promised land would be like going from Martinez down to San Jose, uh, like, you know, 60 miles or something like that. And it took them 40 years to get to the promised land. And one of the things that held them up 
is they kept getting mixed up in where they find their security. They kept thinking it was in these idols and these things of the world in, in the way in which they get life. And God kept giving them life and gifts and manna and water and all kinds of miracles. And they appreciated it for a second. And then they reverted back to the way of the world of finding security in external things. And we serve a God who gives us an internal security because he gives us an internal kingdom, the inner kingdom of the kingdom of God. And so our temptation is to find security outside of ourselves. And you've heard me say before that the most basic definition of addiction is when we try to solve inside problems with outside things. And so as much as money is, you know, a great, you know, sort of way in which we do what we do and it's neutral. And yet sometimes the, the, the attachment we have to it sometimes can be, it's where we find our security and there's a level of security that's true, pay the rent and be on time. And, but I don't put that as security. I put that as responsibility. We're responsible with our money, but we find our security in Christ. So I just want to mention that idea. And then just to close this idea, and we are blessed to be reminded that we are not of this world. I'm not saying we check out of what needs to be done in this world, but that sometimes we, we get discouraged by what's going on in this world. And so I just want to encourage us that our inner life is connected to the inner life of God. And the inner life is connected to the inner kingdom that is the kingdom of God. And that we realize that we are travelers through this world. The scriptures say we're sojourners in a foreign land. Not that we have to be austere and removed, but that we know our citizenship is in God, in Christ, and that we as a community of couples share a citizenship together in Christ. So as we think about money, we want to be responsible with it. We want to be playful with it. We want to be all the things that we want our relationship to be is reflected on what we do with money, balanced, um, that it has fun in it and it has responsibility in it and it's not one or the other, but that our security is rooted in the kingdom that we're a part of and that we have a savior there's not a religion out there that actually has a savior. They either rejected one or they're waiting for one. And we're blessed to have one. <laughs> that God poured himself in flesh so that we could be part of a kingdom that is forever and not limited by the constraints of this world. So those are my thoughts and love you guys and God bless you guys. Such a great evening with all of you. And may God continue to inspire us to have these conversations, to continue them. Heavenly King, <clears throat> comforter spirit of truth who is everywhere present, and you fill all things. You are the treasure of blessings and giver of life. I come before you with a humble heart seeking your guidance with my work and finances. Lord, you are the source of all good things, and I trust that you see my needs and my struggles. I ask for your wisdom and strength as I respond to the demands of my job and I pray that you would help me find balance and fulfillment in the work I do. Lord, bless me to work with integrity, diligence, and a peaceful heart. When stress and uncertainty arise, remind me of your presence and your promise to guide me through it all. Calm my heart and mind and help me find balance amidst the busyness of life. May I be a reflection of your light and love in the workplace, treating others with kindness, respect, and fairness. Guide me to make decisions and use my talents that they may glorify and honor you. Grant me peace of mind knowing that you are my provider and that you will supply all my needs. Help me to be a good steward of the resources you have entrusted to me. And I ask for your wisdom and strength to keep money in its rightful place in my life. Let it never control me, but may I use it to serve you, my family, and to further your kingdom. Help me to be a faithful steward using resources you've given me with a heart of generosity and purpose. Thank you, Lord, for your constant love and care. As the birds and lilies of the field place their trust in you, I place my work, my finances, and my future in your hands, trusting that you will lead me towards blessings and good things. This we ask in your name. Amen.